much big muscle, we've got a 1966 Chevrolet Chevelle with 604 horsepower and a wicked bad attitude. So hang on, because today is going to be outstanding. Seriously, it's going to be good. My name is Mike Musto. Each week I travel the country with the goal of showcasing the best and baddest muscle cars and hot rods around. Every car has a past and every owner a story. Welcome to the world of Big Muscle. Today we're looking at my uh, 1966 Chevy Chevelle Malibu. I've been working on the car for about four years. I uh, bought it at the uh, tail end of 2008 during the whole economic downfall there um, as strictly a stress reliever. And it slowly evolved into, you know, kind of like the dream car. And uh, over the course of the last four years, uh, with the help of a lot of friends, I was able to put this car together. We've got it running now for about four months, and it's really just been ideal as far as what I wanted, what I pictured, and uh, what the end result ended up being as far as the performance, the reliability, and just the overall drivability of the car. Gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Big Muscle. Today we are driving the 1966 Chevrolet Malibu Chevelle. You know, it's a car that, while it may look like a pro touring car, it was actually developed by Enzo to be more of a kind of a grand tour. When you design a grand touring car, you want a couple of things, right? You want a comfortable ride, you want compliant suspension, you want great brakes, and you want halfway decent gas mileage. And that's something he's actually managed to encompass in this car and to incorporate very, very well. You know, from a, a looks standpoint, it's very sinister. The, you know, the, the gloss black paint with the bronze striped wheels lend to a look that is very, very kind of intimidating. But I'll be honest with you, once you get in this thing and you start driving it, it's really anything but. Engine-wise, we're talking about an LS3 that's been kind of massaged by Nelson Racing Engines to the tune of just a tad over 600 horsepower. And I mean, the car goes. I mean, you, you roll into it, and it'll basically just pull for days. I mean, the transmission is a T56 out of a 2002 Trans Am. And to be honest, I mean, it shifts flawlessly. One thing I do have to say, though, is the clutch is a sledgehammer. I mean, this is not a car that I want to get stuck in traffic with. Now, you're looking at me driving this thing, right? And I've got my hands on basically what seems to be like a 20 inch steering wheel. I mean, this is pizza pie size, but it works. The way that Enzo did this interior was by combining kind of new and old, right? And, and of course we've showcased you guys cars before that do that. They take a little bit of new and a little bit of old and they meld it together. Well, what Enzo did was he kept it primarily old school. The dash is 100% stock with tiny, tiny little differences. So for instance, there are numbers on the temp gauge as opposed to just low and high. The door panels, this looks like they're bone stock, but they're not. Enzo actually took a lot of time and sat down with the designer to say, this is how I want the car to be portrayed. Well, the interior, you know, there was definitely some purpose behind it. I'm not as svelte as I look on camera. I'm 6'3", about 235 pounds. So, I had to design the interior around my comfort. One of the big things I've noticed about newer cars is the ergonomics, as far as when you're sitting in the car, the comfort level that you achieve by just putting your elbows down in certain areas or where the shifter is positioned. So when I went to talk to Mark Lopez up at Elegance Interiors, we literally sat down for probably four hours on his desk and I made him sketch everything out. He had the car for about two and a half weeks. He listened to what I wanted. He achieved it, I feel, in the way that he put the interior together. What we did is we basically created a 7 8 style rear seat that he fabricated that makes the interior look actually larger than it is when you look in through the window. Uh, the seats are all the way back, uh, and when they're all the way back, my leg can't actually disengage the clutch all the way. I, I have to actually click it up. So those little things for me were important. Leg room, you know, being able to put my kids behind me while I'm in the car. 
Uh, all of the interior cues are taken from the 60s as far as the original styling of the car, but we just modernized it a little bit, created a little bit more of an aggressive attitude, and then just refined it. The suspension, the guys at Rytec did a great job, a great job on giving him a set of single adjustables for this thing. You don't need triple adjustables on a car like this because I'll be honest with you, it's just overkill. This thing is more of a kind of a set it and forget it type of automobile. Cruising like this is all fine and dandy and it's, it's great, you know, cruising along 60 miles an hour, no big deal. But again, you take this car, right, what do you do? You drop it down to gear, whack it, freaking pulls, man. That, I mean, well, that's, as Matt Farrow would say, that's possible, Jeff. So, let's just leave it at that, so. School zone. Flip the bitch, get out of here. Flip the bitch in the school zone, because they love that. For the kids, Mike. For the kids. Do it for the kids, Do it for Mike. the kids. You know what you have to What's do. What's up, kids? I got kids over here that motioning for me to do a burnout. However, I'm not gonna do a burnout. Why? Because we're in a school zone. You should still do a burnout. I'm not doing a burnout. You should do a burnout, it's for the kids. I'm not doing a burnout for the kids. Do a burnout for the kids. I'm not doing a burnout in a school zone for the kids. <laughs> now the school zone signs have ended, so now we can go. A lot of people ask me, though, like, how do you review a car, and, and what do you look for? And my answer is, well, we review it based on what the owner says he wanted to do with the car. In Enzo's case, he wanted to build a great grand touring car that could not only go from point A to point B, hundreds of miles away in complete comfort, but I wanted a car that could handle, brake, turn, and do all the things that a good grand touring car should do. So we did the on-road portion where we just kind of did the distance style thing, and now what we're doing is we're cruising through the canyons and we're gonna do the handling, the braking, I'm gonna tell you how it is. It shifts beautifully. We can go down, we can rumble through the gears, okay? Come into a corner, hit the brakes. The brakes are off a Z06 Corvette and they're manual. Turn the car in. Now, we're not doing anything crazy. It's not like we're going monumental speeds, but what we're doing is putting the car through kind of a little handling course just to get an idea if, it's, if there's body roll, if there's any squeaks, if there's any rattles, and to kind of See how the whole package works in conjunction with each other. The car so far is great. Manual brakes, if you're not used to them, they take a little getting used to, but they stop the car absolutely fine. You go in, you feel the steering, right? You turn in, even with this big wheel, how is it? Well, it's actually really nice. Look, there's no roll in the car. The seats, even though they're not high back seats, are holding me in just fine going through the corner. Right? <laughs> car handles great. And you gotta remember that a 66 Chevelle is not a small car. These are big cars, they're heavy cars with a long wheelbase, okay? We drove a 66 Chevelle last season and it, it was a fabulous, fabulous car, but with such a different personality than this, even though they're the same make and model. That's the beauty of the hobby. You can differentiate, you can have fun, you can enjoy, and at day's end, you can pull up to the exact same car make and model and have something completely different. Having been born in Peru, I came here in 1981 when I was six years old. Uh, the first car I rode in, my dad was actually uh, borrowing a car from his brother. It was, an, I think, a 1969 911T. And it was my absolute first experience in any kind of a performance vehicle ever. And it changed my world. I mean, from that point forward, I became overly obsessed with four wheels. I think ultimately the guy that was kind of driving that a little bit from behind was my dad. He just kind of always liked that I was into it. Uh, when he was 18 and he lived in Long Beach, he, he had been uh, here in the States for a while back then, he bought a 1957 Chevy Bel Air. And so when I was 14 and a half, almost 15 years old, we bought a 57 Bel Air for me. And that's what kind of took me to where I'm at today. I had this ideal group of friends when I was growing up. We used to sit around late nights when we were 15, 16 years old, reading car magazines, talking about what we wanted to build. And slowly but surely, we all kind of elevated each other's games. By the time we were 18, 19 years old, we were driving 11 second cars on the street, you know, delivering pizzas, literally. Uh, one of my best friends uh, became a very famous engine builder, although his car was terribly slow during those times and I beat him every single time we raced. That was, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's Tom Nelson from Nelson Racing Engines, who I credit to building this wonderful engine. He was one of the guys who contributed to the build, but just for the record, never beat me in a drag race. But anyway, I was very fortunate because it really kept us all out of trouble. I mean, we were all, guys that probably would have gone down different paths 
were it not for cars, you know, the cars really saved us. And that's really what I'm, I attribute to the friendships that I had when I was a kid. One of the things about talking to Enzo is that he's got a massive personality and it's, it's really kind of infectious. I mean, you talk to him and he gets excited and he starts telling stories and then you get excited listening to his stories and you're like, God damn it. And the reason you say God damn it is because you don't have a story that's as good as his story about the stuff that he did when he was a kid. I mean, you know, drag racing and doing this and running from the cops, which you should never do. But I mean, not only does this guy have, you know, a great family, he's got an awesome car, he's got a kick-ass job. Not like, I mean, we have a pretty cool job too, I'm not gonna lie to you. But I, I guess in the end, what's really cool is it, it's, it's nice to see good people have good things. And it's nice to see somebody who had a vision from the beginning develop. This is why we do what we do. This is why we're in the desert right now in this awesome Chevelle. If, if I can't convince you that stuff like this is cool, I am so not doing my job right. Sometimes on the show, when all the pieces fall perfectly into place, we realize just how lucky we are. Like the time we drove a blown Cadillac down the Pacific Coast Highway, or when we did burnouts in a GT500 Mustang, or, or maybe it was a time when we were ripping up the canyons in a Corvette crushing 69 AMX. Those are the type of things we live for on the show. Today too was one of those days, for as the sun set and the day came to a close, we knew we had just experienced a car where all the time, energy, and parts worked perfectly together. Man, hot day, hot day. Oh wait, how do we get out of here? The gate that's now closed. Where's the stop sign? Can you come in this way? No. Is this right? How do we get out? We go all the way down? Nice. What the f Tell the guys to go out that way because there's no exit over here. Woo! Sweaty hot. This gate opens inward, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. What? How do we get out? <laughs> 